Dear parents, your vacation is not your nanny's vacation. My cousin, let's call her Amy. She currently is a nanny for a new family and it's going well. She made the mistake of not setting boundaries with the first family. When she was hired for the first job, she was told the family takes a vacation every year to the beach in Disney World, Florida, and how beautiful it is and how lucky she will be to be able to go. My cousin said her idea of a vacation would be to go skiing, noting the fact her idea for vacation is not theirs. So in August, the parents were beside themselves because Amy had not committed to going on vacation with them. The father said to her via email something along the lines of she should feel honored to be able to get a free trip to Disney World and how expensive it is she'll never be able to afford to go on her own, as if she wanted to go in first place. Here's the problem the family don't seem to understand. This is your vacation, not your nanny's. This family has four kids, ages 3, 6, 8, 12, and she works her ass off when she has them. My cousin said she was having panic attacks thinking about trying to keep four kids safe at Disney World because the parents are useless when she is around safe for times when the mother will want her to go to family outings and the agreement is they work as a team. The family tried throwing in her face her airfare and travel would be paid for so she would be expected to take a pay cut. There is no much more to this story but I am so proud of my cousin for refusing to go and letting the family know this is a vacation for them. Not her. Families who can afford a traveling nanny let alone a nanny is considered a luxury to most. You need that nanny go on vacation, with you more than that nan he wants to go. So what is God forbid the nanny may end up enjoying herself one night? You should want your nanny to enjoy herself even if one night so she will go next year. And stop with the culty your family that only leads to manipulation. Your nanny is your nanny. Story 2 AITA for correcting the lie my half-siblings told that my dad used to be their stepdad and he dumped them into foster care once our mom died? Not the a-hole. So I, 27M, have three younger half-siblings, 24F, 22M, and 21M. We're maternal half-siblings and I have a different dad to them. Their dad was dating my mom for several years, but they never got married. So he wasn't legally ever my stepdad, but I guess he would kind of get the title since he lived with my mom and I lived with her half the time. He was never interested in me and I was never interested in him. He used to creep me out, so I don't really think of him like that, but technically their dad would have been my step. Mine was never anything to them. When my mom was pregnant with the youngest, their dad was arrested and he went to prison. He was briefly released eight years later, but ended up going back to prison. He wasn't a good guy and has a long list of convictions now. I was eight when mom died. I was living with my dad full time when she died. She was not taking good care of me and was taking her anger about her boyfriend's release out on me through a lot of yelling and talking to me like shit. When mom died a social worker got involved and my half-siblings were removed. They had no biological family willing to take them and the social worker asked my dad if he would consider a kinship care agreement so they could be raised alongside me. My dad said that was not something he would be interested in and so my half-siblings were placed in foster care. My dad did agree to some visits. We had one visit every two months for years. The visits were never easy because my half-siblings would ask to move in with my dad and me and they would ask why my dad didn't visit and why couldn't they be with him instead so we could live together. They were separated most of the time in foster care and would put that on me and my dad as well. I refused the visits once I turned 16. I hadn't wanted them for a while, but it was more annoying than anything to have to repeat the same conversation every two months. My dad let me make the decision because he really had to drag me there for most of the visits anyway. We had no contact for years, and then just over two years ago they reached out to me and said they wanted a relationship again. I told them I didn't and they said they wouldn't mention my dad again. So I agreed and things were going alright. Not having to have that fight with them made it easier to care. But then a few weeks ago I found out at my half-brother's 21st birthday party that they have been lying to people claiming my dad was their stepdad and he dumped them in foster care as soon as mom died. They apparently knew most people wouldn't think he was wrong if he was just my dad they never knew. So they spun a story. I told people the truth when it came up and afterward I told my half-siblings that I was so done with them and that their obsession with my dad taking them in is what drove me crazy before. I told them he wasn't there anything and lying was not the way to win me over. They accused me of ruining their lives by exposing their lies. Ida? Story 3. My ex's arbitrary deadline for having kids is coming up and I want to use my toddler to wish him a happy birthday. So, 
My ex-husband, 29M, and I, 28F, haven't seen one another in about three years, and before that we hadn't seen one another for about two years before that to finalize our divorce. We were high school sweethearts, each other's first everything, and got married right before I turned 21. We disagreed on when to have children. He wanted to start right away, but I wanted to wait until I was 25 to get ourselves situated in life. This led to him cheating, admitting it, and then leaving me. He told me he didn't want to be the 30 years old with a newborn. When I saw him last, it was to handle a banking issue we both thought was resolved when we separated. I was heavily pregnant with my son when I saw him last at 25. When he saw my very swollen belly, you could see the sadness in his eyes. We were cordial and he congratulated me and my response was, Yup, pregnant right when I intended to be. If I were to become pregnant, his face fell a little more. Now, he and his new wife have yet to have kids. They married right before the banking issue happened. In all the years we were together, I couldn't tell you when we actually used a condom and I wasn't on birth control. Looking back on it now, I have a feeling my ex is infertile, though I couldn't tell you if, in fact, I am correct in my assumption. Well, I want to send him a happy birthday message from me and my son on his 30th birthday to twist the knife in. He absolutely shattered me. I tried desperately to save my marriage and I am feeling petty AF knowing his arbitrary deadline is here and there isn't a child in sight. My son is my world. I have an amazing partner who would move heaven and earth and trek through hell for me and our child. In the end, I did luck out. That doesn't mean I don't still harbor some ill feelings and want to make it known on a day that I know my ex will absolutely remember. I want to do it so bad. But then again, I'd be a terrible mother to use my child in this fashion. Story 4. My co-worker is becoming a nuisance. Not sure if this belongs here, but her behavior strikes me as entitlement considering she's technically a veteran staff member. You be the judge. So I, 31F, work as a registration clerk in a medical office and I have a co-worker that is really testing my patients. Let's just call her L, 38. For reference. There are five other reg clerks that work alongside L and I, so seven in total. During each shift, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., there is always two of us manning the registration desks. In one shift, we will likely register 100 to 180 patients, so we stay fairly busy throughout the day, and we will often have to multitask, which can become very stressful, especially when you have a line full of patients to waiting to check in and discharge, and the phone's ringing off the hook. The issue with L is that she will leave her station multiple times throughout the day and will stay gone for a super long time that is worsening as time goes on. She sometimes takes our lunches when we're allotted 30 minutes. She will leave the building to run errands after her lunch break that consists of going to the tanning bed and will be gone for hours, and will go to the back and chit-chat with the APRNS and nurses for long periods of time multiple times a day. Another irritating thing she does is that she will keep her head down low behind her computers to be less noticeable by patients coming into the lobby so naturally they will beeline to the employee that they do see, or she will keep her head down in her phone and ignore them by pretending she does not see them, and if they know that she's seen them she will send them over to the other reg working with her by acting like she's busy on her computer when she is in fact not busy. Oftentimes we are kept 45 minutes to an hour after the end of shift, depending on the time a patient checks in. We have to be present in the lobby to ensure that the patient exits the building safely. So instead of taking turns on staying over, she will often leave as soon as the shift is over, burdening us other reg girls with staying late almost every shift. One time she had a meltdown weeks after her boyfriend broke up with her because she found out he tried to add a few of us other reg girls on Snapchat that resulted in her sitting in the parking lot for three hours crying and hyperventilating, leaving the other reg girl to handle all the work by themselves. It's been months since Elle's boyfriend split and she still gets teary-eyed when talking about him. She's recently become even more entitled to doing whatever the hell she wants because she got drunk, fell, and fractured her hand. Albeit she's a little slower to register patients, but she can still do the job and doesn't help at all in other ways that would be beneficial, like answering the phones. She will just sit there in with her head down in her phone and ignore it. There are other things I could mention, but hopefully you get the picture. All of the registration girls has an issue with this lady's behavior, and no action is being taken by our managers despite multiple complaints. None of us are really comfortable with taking this issue to HR because our managers are amazing women who are really good to us and I'm not looking to get them in trouble with the higher-up. 
I guess I'm mostly trying to figure out how to approach her individually or draw so much attention to the behavior that it can no longer be ignored. One thing to understand about her is that she has a type A personality so confronting her is a headache, which I suspect is one of the reasons our supervisors ignore most of the behavior. I personally do not like conflict and prefer to avoid it if I can, but it's getting ridiculous. Story 5. Ten years later, I got revenge on horrible my landlord. Long story short, landlord was a childish jerk to all of us. He had us sharing about with four other people and charged us double while his spoiled son and girlfriend lived rent-free. A few months ago, I had a lawyer contact me and ask if I remembered renting there and if I'd testify against him. Turns out, he wasn't the true owner of the property. His brother bankrolled all of the properties he told us he owned. And in turn, the landlord was supposed to remodel on time and stay on budget to get the houses sold. Instead, he lived on and wasted the money his brother gave him and pocketed all of the rent without his brother's knowledge. His face went white when he saw me, and I tripped his lawyer up who asked me two weak questions then said he didn't have any questions for me. As I left the courtroom, I saw him from the corner of my eye sneer as I walked past, and he very loudly called out to me a sing-song voice by Sarah right in front of the jury. Today I learned he lost the entire case. Petty revenge activated.